We tell ourselves stories in order to live. I had never looked at domestic politics right. until 88 campaign. I started looking and I was really appalled. Yeah. <laughs> assured her, don't worry, it has nothing to do with, with us, and, but, it, but it did. See enough and write it down, I tell myself. And then some morning when the world seems drained of wonder someday when I'm only going through the motions of doing what I am supposed to do, which is right. On that bankrupt morning, I will simply open my notebook and there it will all be a forgotten account with accumulated interest, paid passage back to the world out there. Let's talk about Joan Didion, who I consider her the, the biggest influence on my own writing, actually, who's not a poet. Now, I'm a poet, so, of course, most of my biggest, truest, biggest influences are poets, and a lot of them aren't even writers in English, but Didion's dryness and her density, which are not two things that are generally linked together, are so important to me. There's a wryness and... From her entire career, there's a wryness to her writing and, her, and a willingness to sort of see everything as detached and everything as if people are alien, almost. What was interesting in, because I reread a number of the essays from her, particularly pieces from Slouching Towards Bethlehem, the White Album, and then ultimately leading to a few items in political fictions, and there were a few things that came to mind. One and maybe this is the main thing that came to mind, in addition to just appreciating it for all the details that you've mentioned, this was the first time in reading her work that I got the sense of a, almost like, a, you know, she, whether she knew it or not, there's, you get the impression that there's a collective narrative being built here, and the subject of which is, yes, she is, there's a sort of detachment to it, but you feel in this book a, a sense of someone within her own person, you know, really anticipating something very terrible is going to happen either to her or to this the you know the world around her and it was what's really interesting to sort of consider is that i feel that especially with the recent events in her life that that which she was dreading yet could not necessarily put her finger on ultimately came to pass for her perhaps not in the way that anyone anticipated i think anybody who knows of joan didion knows of the unfortunate fact that she lost her husband and her daughter roughly around the same time and has some and it, like the now pointing in her career I feel like she says I spent all these years waiting for something terrible to happen now it has now I have to deal with it uh, this was like I said this was the first time I felt like that thread had almost it was disturbingly as if everything was culminating in this ultimate passage of her life these last two books are hard for me to read or talk about because they're so painful. Um, the husband one's kind of painful, but he was an older man, so it wasn't as bad. But the book about the death of her daughter, which happened within a year of the death of her husband, that was awful. Mm -hmm. But what, what I don't understand about her is, is lately I feel like there's a backlash against her. 
I'm not quite sure why. One, because she's still alive, but she's, like, completely and utterly down. I mean, like, you're not attacking a person who's who's at the height of their game or their personal life or has even a whole lot left to hope for. Nor is she really participating in the either political or social scene in any way to sort of merit the case against her as far as I'm concerned. Right. She hasn't done so since the Bush years. And in, in a strange way, her writings in the Bush years are interesting in that they seem to... She seems to see the same ideology, the ideological passion and deludedness that she saw on the left in the 60s and made her sympathetic to Nixon is what she saw in the Republicans in the late 90s and early aughts. Yes. And after that, she withdraws from the world and only writes about her personal life. And that's, that's fascinating because the rest of her career... It is rooted in her personal life. There's mentions of her moving from California to New York and what she hated about California and all that. But most of it is actually social commentary. And the last two years, which is, you know, also we mean we should probably point out, her last two books have been probably the best-selling books she's written. Misery Sells, honestly. Just set this up. Do you mind if I read a small passage from Political Fictions, which I think is a good path? To- Go ahead sort of set us on our journey so uh this is the the context for this is as she's writing about politics she was often asked the question of you know basically where did her politics come from as if they were eccentric opaque somehow unreadable they are not they are the logical product of a childhood largely spent among conservative california republicans this was before the meaning of conservative changed in a post-war boom economy The people with whom I grew up were interested in low taxes, balanced budget, and a limited government. They believed, above all, that limited government had no business tinkering with the private or cultural lives of its citizens. In 1964, in accord with that interest and beliefs, I voted ardently for Barry Goldwater. Had Goldwater remained the same age and continued running, I would have voted for him in every election thereafter. Instead, shocked and and to the curious extent personally offended by the enthusiasm with which California Republicans, who had jettisoned an authentic conservative, Goldwater, were rushing to embrace Ronald Reagan, I registered as a Democrat, the first member of my family, and perhaps in my generation still the only member to do so. That this did not involve taking a markedly different view on any issue was was a novel discovery, and one that led me to view, quote, America's two-party system, end quote, with... And this was my real introduction to American politics, a somewhat doubtful eye. I had never looked at domestic politics right. until the 88 convention, 88 campaign. And I started looking and I was really appalled. Yeah. <laughs> and appalled at the way it was covered or appalled at the way it, at, it was intrinsically? At all those, both those things. Yeah. At, appalled at the way it was intrinsically and, and appalled at the extent to which the way it was covered collaborated with the way it was intrinsically and enabled it. Uh, it was, uh, I, I, I mean, it was astonishing to go out on a, I mean, it's, if, it's not astonishing to any reporter because they've done it, right? Mm. But it was astonishing to me to go out on a, out on a campaign, for, you know, before an election and find out that it was a series of setups, uh, that it was very like, I mean, I had spent some time, a few weeks in the White House press room in the 80s. And it was very like that. It was that was again an astonishing experience. That was, you had a series of little events. But, but with respect to political conventions and political coverage, you had first of all you have people. Like, you have books like Boys on the Bus, which was a sort of chronicle of yeah. what it's like and how, how right. that takes place. Right. So why should was it so so amazing to yeah. me? Because it was still going on as if it was tabula rasa, as if the Boys on the Bus had never been written. <laughs> there it was. <laughs> yeah, oh, I see. <laughs> Uh, you know, so that in addition to just knowing about her politics, I think it says quite a number of things that I think will allow you to realize the sort of journey where she's set on when you read these essays uh, in a weird kind of way and in a way sort of ironic, given everything you would have expected from me saying this statement. Um, if you read those essays of Joan Gideon going through all of the anxieties of California, going to Haight-Ashbury, living through the late 60s and forward, there is some ways of reading her like, almost like a character out of Betty Friedan. You know, she is a sort of, everything about her would suggest that this is going to be a traditional conservative 
housewife potential, but she does nothing of the kind. And she is in some way, as I say in these essays, anticipating uh, this anxiety that she's feeling. And one of the things you do read in the essays is that they do, especially the titular essays of Slouching Towards Bethlehem and the White Album, they are a personal examination of her forthcoming self-concerns, but framed in a way that's also removed from herself and dealing with something in a substantial way, which to, I would agree with you, is really of the best prose stylist I've ever encountered. Yeah, it's just amazing. And I find the backlash against her... One, I find the backlash against her interesting, because in the aughts, there's a lot of this, a lot of you know people still talking about the Republican betrayal itself. For some for reasons that I can't put my finger on, and I guess the, the odd thing about this is we're going to actually have to talk a little bit about politics here. But that narrative of what happened to those Republicans turned Democrats who are still kind of against a lot of the activist movements has largely been dropped. Now, one, it's kind of convenient. You want to talk about a parallel to Joe Danian's life? Hillary Clinton. Except that without without, as far as I can tell, the self-reflectedness of Didion. And two, it just seems like people are attacking her because her concerns came out of a milieu that they're just not a part of. What's funny about this, and it's definitely unexpected, I think in the climate today um, of her essays, I would say the book of essays that people would consider the most dated, even though I would consider it uh, at least nominally the most relevant, was those political that political fictions book. That her most as far you know her recent essay collections, the most recent one that was two thousand and one. Uh, that definitely feels representative of a time that I certainly felt grew up with and frankly miss, which was the true skepticism of both of this political situation as such. I think in the aftermath of Bush v. Gore and then, you know, throughout the entire 2000s, that attitude became sort of taboo. People went back to the idea that, you know, oh, if you let the your the bad guys win, be they conservative or progressives, you know, you're, you're really going to be in a worse situation than being rational and saying, like, well, yeah. there's reason to be skeptical about both. And the thing is, the other parallel book to that, even though it has a different thrust and subject Hitchens book on the Clintons is a similar story which I as I say those two books are still vital and yet they feel like they will become the most dated of all of their authors works precisely because they're in some sense un 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 undesired truths as far as I'm concerned but to go back to my critique of, of Hitchens he didn't have the balls to stay to stay anti-political, even when he, he, his allies were very, were very, uh, he was just defending them on one or two issues. Whereas Didion kind of did. And Didion, Didion wasn't a pundit. We don't think of her as a pundit. Well, I mean, I, I don't even think that new journalism comes anywhere near approaching punditry in a way that we think it is um you know new, new journalism is more of a you know the best you could come close to being like it is like the old sense of a field reporter and even guys today like matt taibbi are not new journalists in any sense of the term they're not a part of any goddamn story they're they're just narrative pundits right? Taibbi's book on denialist in the in the arts and he was, he was not just talking about conservative denialists. He was also talking about liberal 9-11 conspiracists and stuff. It's the only time that he's a character in one of his own books. But even then, he is so partisan and kind of, kind of unreflectively partisan that it doesn't have the same feel. Like I, and, he, and again, he, he, he even feels of a different decade. Even though he was young in the aughts in the late 90s when all this stuff was developing, and he still writes for Rolling Stone, if you look at liberal political concerns and like vocal act activism now, Matt Taibbi seems a million miles away from Arthur Chu. You know, and frankly, way more substantive. And I didn't think Matt Taibbi was all that substantive a lot of the time. 
Gideon's questioning of things like why was Maoism so appealing to, you know, hippies at the end of Hyde Ashbury? And why did they believe it like like a religion? Mm-hmm. And what, what's, what's great about her style is that on, superficially, when reading it, you get a sense that she's really not commenting mostly on things. She's just letting the details go away. But that's like a trick of the trade. It's all the 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 distance and sense of being able to portray everything as sort of like an alien subject tells you exactly what she's thinking about you know what she's seeing. And that's a style I really appreciate. In fact, you're probably referencing in a roundabout way that great short piece called Comrade Lasky C P U S A M L yeah that's a great look. it's it's very short it's like what five pages at most i don't know if you want to talk about it uh you know go ahead i will let i i won't interrupt no it, that just a description of how he, she describes him and the way they go about with this rhetoric and she kind of i don't even know if it was intentionally well she is intentionally pairing it to religion but I don't know if this was intentional, but the way she writes it, like, almost millennialist rhetoric. Now, in the one way, people would say, oh, this is just a Nixonite, you know, a Nixonite Goldwaterite trick. In another way, it absolutely isn't. Well, I think what fundamentally isn't and what people would get, and this is what I got in rereading, as I said, specifically those titular essays in Slouching Towards Bethlehem and the White Album, but also this is that she's... <sighs> She is certainly writing at it from a distance, but you're, as I said before, you're dealing with a woman who is open about the anxiety she has, and if she is going to these places. She, you know, if you read Slouching Towards Bethlehem, she's a part of that story and in it. Uh, you know, she and you don't go to these subject areas from the mindset of what people are going to accuse her of, which is just a, a Nixon Nixonite conservative sitting there and just being pissed at what you see you are dealing with someone who is on some core level confronting the anxieties in herself that she is seeing and depicting in the others around her she is of this setting she is allowing herself to be of this setting that's important in my mind i had a strong feeling that it was necessary that there was no reason to trust the reporter, unless you knew where the reporter was. And if you didn't know where the reporter was standing, then, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I really objected to the, to the notion of objectivity, of the Swadison objectivity, because it didn't seem to me very real. The reporter is always standing someplace. I don't mean that he is biased, or I just mean that he, you just want to know where he's standing so that you can triangulate different reports from different people against each other. Right, I mean, the only, the only author I can think of that does that almost as well as she does mm-hmm. um, is one that people have kind of forgotten about outside of literary circles, and that's Dennis Johnson. Um, he he also did a similar book. God, I believe it was actually probably around the same time as Political Fictions, where he talks about how the counterculture, and, uh, you know, had really the the actual counterculture apparat- apparatus in the United States mm-hmm. was really in conservative movements. And he goes and he you know and he's a, he's obviously a liberal, but he he really like goes there and is open to it. And Gideon's the same way with, with her left-wing subjects because they, she sees them as produced by you know, California. And it is interesting. I mean, like, the only place in the United States, and this includes New York, and I've been all over the U.S., where I actually encounter Maoist, who, you know, other than, like, at universities, is in the Bay Area. You know, I, I encounter them in universities everywhere else, but in the, in the Bay, you can be in college forever without being in college. Yeah, I think this, this is probably where the real manifestation of her conservative comes in, rather than just saying, like, oh, I'm someone who voted for Barry Goldwater and wanted to. It's more about, you know, when you read in her work, the sense almost implicitly, or maybe even explicitly, that there's a sense of unease and potential malevolence in the land itself 
in California or wherever, it, particularly California, is some is operating on a near religious kind of attitude, or at the very least mythical attitude. What? That's big. No, it's one that you would think the contemporary left would actually sympathize with because basically she kind of sees a lot of the problems with California as from the fact that it's an imperial mission that's run out of room that can't justify itself beyond the point where it's at. What does she say? If we've gotten to the end of the ocean, it better work here, basically? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a great line. Again, the first essay in the in Slouching Towards Bethlehem, I think, is more or less says that. And again, that's an essay about a woman who kills her husband by, you know, setting him on fire, making it look like an accident so she can get double indemnity insurance. And that's the other thing, you know, that about that essay is that it's not just a condemnation of a woman who would kill her husband. It's a condemnation of a society which would produce such a woman who would think that way. And the opening salvos of that essay all about how the religion of this society is just as easily is the is are the movies like double indemnity frankly and how the promise made by being in california is not just an empty promise but a promise that is in almost conscientiously creating these destructive events you know, and as a Marxist from the Deep South and the East Coast, I mean, even though I move, a lot of my a lot of my partner's families from California. A lot of my best friends actually live in the Bay. But I have to admit, when reading Diddy and when I actually go out to the Bay Area, and I'm being particular about the Bay in LA, it really does feel like this is where Americanism has gone wild. That contradictory traits of Americanism have gone wild there. I mean. You can talk about the Bay, the Bay's, you know, hyper-liberality to the point of parody, which is true. You know, it's not, it's not actually that much of a parody. But you can also talk about, like, the Valley's strip mall conservative, you know, libertarianism, and the number of, like, for-profit universities that come up there. And even in the deep, deracinated South that I am from, you don't see that. You know who I think on this topic in particular is probably her closest peer, and it may not be someone you anticipate me saying. Oh, go ahead. Philip K. Dick. Kind of. You know, in California I, I, in particular. But it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, the, in his, and he's, he's doing it in his own, frankly, paranoiac way, which is through science fiction. But essentially, if you look through, especially, you know, books like Through a Scanner Darkly or um, – any essays he sort of, or short stories he writes about how the idea of California as degraded and plastic, uh, I think you will see echoes in these two people. And they are nothing alike on many, many levels, but I think they are reaching similar conclusions on this topic. And even you know, sometimes passages feel like they could be situated in one or the other. That's funny to me because... Another thing as a southern as a southerner, I have this innate hostility to New York intellectual culture, mm-hmm. which I guess kind of shows up sometimes on the show. But um, just a few times, yeah. Where I'm just like, well, I just don't. I, I don't always think it's earned, um, and when it is earned, I tend to think it's it tends to be black and Jewish. Yeah, I mean, I know you know me. I've been the biggest promoter of Jewish literature on the show, as if it needed any promotion. Right. As I was to say, at this point, like promoting Saul Bellows is almost a trope. But you know, I, I was. I think another parallel is another person people kind of turned against. But the you know, Philip Kiddick is one parallel. John Updike is the other. Yeah, that's a good um, one. and John Updike. Is you know you read AMP? I, I read AMP and I didn't think I liked John Updike for many many years. Uh, and then I read Rabbit and I kind of liked him, but it kind of seemed over the top and obvious. But then I read the Marple stories and then uh, the Sloan stories, mm-hmm. and I really got it. And I got his genius, and I think his is similar to Didion's, and it's very easy to misread because it is liberal in an older sense. Um, and in Didion's, maybe, Didion's a small-c conservative her entire life. 
Um, I, I, we talk about her like she's dead. She's still alive, but in some ways, I can't imagine there's much left there. Well, can I tell you the most one of the most disturbing things I listened to? And you know, we, Joan Didion. I, I mean, for all the emotional details we get out of these essays, she comes across as, and I mean this complimentary, as a stone edifice. Right. I mean, this is like a woman of immense stature and of literary note. When she was being interviewed with Terry Gross on NPR, I think when the Year of Magical Thinking came out, and this was after Cortana's, her daughter's death, she literally broke down on the Terry Gross show, said, I have nothing to live for anymore, and was sobbing. And Terry Gross did not know what to do. I was sitting there like, I damn believe I even am hearing this. So to but the your thing point. is, she kind of doesn't. I mean, th- this is the thing. Um, and she, to me, in the turn against her seems so cruel, in a way, because one, she is running from a world that is kind of going away. Old white California is gone. Two, she actually was fundamentally suspicious of it the entire time. So the, the people who complain about it, you know, she's only writing about elites. Well, we're going to come to this in a, several conversations we're going to have in this series where I'm like, well, if she'd have done anything else, she would have accused her of cultural appropriation. She's running about what she knows. But that world is kind of gone. And the thing is, you don't get the sense that she was particularly sad that it's kind of gone. But her losing her family, it's too much. As I said, I do get, I did, especially rereading this, you, this is someone on every level was operating under the sense that something bad is going to happen. I feel it in the in her bones in the world around her based on what people are doing. I don't think anybody would have expected it would have happened to her in the way it did. I do I mean it, it, I mean I know it's irrational to say this but it does come across when you read these I mean we t- as to quote Jitty we tell ourselves stories in order to live. It's hard to not envision this as the cruelest way of giving of giving her exactly what she thought was going to happen what struck me about the manson murders was how at the, t- at the moment they happened it seemed as if they seemed inevitable i mean it seemed as if we had been moving toward that moment for about a year there were a lot of rumors about stuff there were a lot of stuff going on around town which you would kind of hear about on the ed- edges of your mind and not want to know any more about. But it was, I mean, it was amazing to, when you, you know, after the, after the, after the fact, it was kind of amazing to see how many lives had intersected with the Manson families. But I can remember we had a babysitter from Nye Reed then and she was very frightened on the night of the murders or the day, the afternoon when we heard about the murders and and I assured her don't worry it has nothing to do with with us and but it but it did it had to, it had to do with every then I, later I was doing I was interviewing Linda Kasabi and it was the wheel person wheel person I, well she, she wasn't the wheel man she was the wheel person <laughs> and the, for the for the LaBianca murder. And I can't remember, maybe also for Tate. Uh, but anyway, the night they did the LaBianca murder, they were driving along Franklin Avenue looking for looking for a, a place to hit. Now that's where we lived. We had French windows open, lights blazing all along the, on the street. Right. In addition to, you feel like most of her critiques of the way society was going are happening to you. It's, it, the, the right is, sh- is shallower, more hyperbolic, and less interested in these things. The left is more about identity and some kind of tribal identity than ever, often while speaking about universality. Well, that was great. all of the so many of those essays, even ones that are kind of funny, like the one on the on uh, Joan Baez's school, you know, they, but in particular, slouching towards Bethlehem, you feel like, wow, this is really waiting for Godot and reality, especially for those kids coming to California in the hopes that something would happen. Literally, so many times you have in this these essays, like I'm waiting for something, anything. 
And even the way that that essay on Comrade Lasky ends is very brilliant and similar in that regard. Yeah, and the thing is, what what I think is tragic, and in two senses, one is tragic that she can't comment on it, on two, it's tragic that, uh, you know, what would she have to say if she did comment on it? Like, the tech boom... If she was writing about the tech boom, I have no doubt that it would feel like she was writing about the same thing she was writing about when she wrote about Comrade Lask, even the politics are almost inverted. You know, and, and, and you may not even have to really worry about inverted politics either. I mean, you may have – you invert her uh, ideology – ideologically speaking, you know, you're going to find a fair amount of like-minded people. The God has just changed. Right, and it's, it's – uh, well, that's the thing about California is – you have these tech nuts and you also have malice, but they exist in literally what is now the most expensive place to live on Earth, or among it. I mean, it's like there, one day in Hong Kong. And so, in a way, it's super hyper-verified. And she was totally critiquing that even at the time, and noted the, the kind of, not so much implicit, ex, explicit hypocrisy of it, but the, like, the way they generated each other. The way this environment sort of generated the class A radicalism to bring up something that we've talked about before. Um, she really picks up on that. And I picked up on it too. I, when I read her, I, you know, I got, you know, we tell, story, uh, we tell stories to ourselves in order to live the collected everything but the year of magical thinking in the most recent even sadder book. Which, uh, by the way, uh, again, it's available through Every Man's Library. If you ever are able to pick up We Tell Ourselves Stories in Order to Live, it's probably one of the most efficient, economic, and portable ways to get perhaps some of the best essays that you're ever going to read. I mean, honestly. I used to sleep with that book, The Bible, and a copy of Das Kapital by my bed, I'm embarrassed to say. No, no, we're, we're going to shame you for such <laughs> such collections. No, go ahead. Yeah, um... <laughs> It was it was literally my um my Harper Collins and my Jewish study Bible both and then stories uh, stories we tell ourselves in order to, in order to live and Das Kapital is what I used to like just poke through at night before I went to sleep when I in in the in the aughts actually in the late aughts when I first became a teacher and Das Kapital is there because it took me a million years to read it but whenever I needed something to like. To sort of sort of hit a spot in my own cynicism, um, I'd read. We tell ourselves stories in order to live because it spoke to me. You know, coming out of the the, the '90s, early aughts, academic culture, where I read Toni Morrison and Richard Bride and took classes in Asian literature, and I know, you know the Jonathan Franzen controversy had just happened. You know, Didion wasn't taught, and. Uh, you know, despite what I've heard a lot of people say, Didion, Alice Munro, uh, Pinchon, Goddess, none of the, I never, they were in my anthology, but we never discussed them. We always discussed other authors. Yeah, let's, and, be, let's, let's be explicit about this, because I think this is exactly uh, getting to perhaps why she's being critiqued here. And let's set this straw man aside i mean grow at least we're at it's anecdotal but at least it's at least a counter narrative uh joan didion thomas pinchon philip roth john updike uh, um cormac mccarthy I, don DeLittle. none of these people were taught in school none i read criticism heard. about criticism about Cormac mccarthy and never read him in school yeah. seriously mm-hmm. so these, uh, these notions that the canon is you know, littered with these particular white men. Oh, wait, I would also include, uh, even though, you know, they're more problem, there's more problem in reading them, Norman Mailer and Gore Vidal. None of these authors were ever on a canonical reading list. No, we discussed them all the time, but we didn't read them. That was a weird thing. Now, di- now n- at the time, no one had turned against Didion. She was a woman, and so still kind of a major commodity. But, you know, I took African American literature, African literature, et cetera, and so forth. I never read any of this stuff. And it's not to say that a lot of the stuff that I didn't read in those things were great. I think Toni Morrison, despite, you know, qualms I have with the hyperbole of her politics, is probably one of the best American writers alive, sincerely. But so is Didion, and I didn't read Didion. Didion wasn't exposed to me. I heard Didion was referenced all the time, but she was never on the list. 
you know, uh, it was there was a lot of writers like that, like Robert Ken Warren, referenced all the time. But I never was actually made to read all the Kingsmen. It, you know, it was, it was um, the same thing for me. I mean, I didn't even get. I mean, frankly, when we were going through our studying of things like the Civil War, the, I mean, if we had ever been asked to read Robert Penn Warren's essay on the aftermath of the, on the, you know, the, the sort of ideologies of the civil war, it would have been a much better experience than what we did read. Now, admittedly, it's hard for like a fourth grader to read that essay. I'll grant you that. Uh, but still it was not even the, shall we say the outputs of that essay and thinking weren't even sort of summarized in a way and presented it was i I will say as a southerner the civil war is something that i think i have down better and i say this because people are like south doesn't understand the civil war yeah actually most of us do and most of us who aren't confederate sympathizers will not tell you some bullshit about it not being about slavery um i was never taught that in school by the way i was never taught that it wasn't about slavery and I went to I went to schools in Georgia back when they spent a month and a half on it. And you had to memorize both both battle names, every major battle in the damn war. So and they don't do that anymore. They haven't done that since the mid '90s. But I'm just telling you, like that's my age group. I'm the last generation that had that. I also had, and as a southerner, no, I don't talk about as a southerner much because I'm an alien southerner. I'm not Protestant. Um, when I was a kid, I wasn't even considered, you know, true white. I grew up in a black neighborhood. My black friends used to call me zebra, right? and I, I will tell you why that is. And it was actually because of family members that weren't were not white that they knew about. It was very, you know, my relationship to race. And I'm not saying this as an out. My relationship to race is actually very, very complicated. And so I find a lot of the a lot of the discussion now. Particularly, I've, most of it comes out of the Midwest and the Northeast. It seems completely divorced from what I grew up with, which was not some racial, you know, post-utopia. It was a pretty racist society. I mean, I tell this story a lot, and it shocks people, but when I was, uh, when I came back from living in Canada for a while, um, and I'll show you how this is about Didion in a minute, but when I came back from living in Canada in a while, we still had a segregated prom court, and we had integrated prom which not even everybody in the area did, because um, we were one of the few schools that was truly integrated because there was no private school in the area. So, so it, was, it was literally like 60-40 school district. And, and, and we had an integrated prom court, and only when people started thinking about Hispanics as not white, which was in my lifetime, that, that I actually, you know, that my school actually started trying to change the rules around that. The reason why I bring this about Didion is Didion distrusts these narratives, but seems to be completely willing to recognize that the West exists on, you know, oceans of blood. All right? She, she seems to completely acknowledge that. Which, this is one of the reasons why I find it so weird that people turn against her. Yes, she's writing about elites, but she's actually condemning the whole thing as sort of a project that comes out of this erasure. And she's super cynical about attempts to fix it because you can't fix something like that. There is no arc of justice that undoes that. Well, I think Joan Didion, more than any other author around, recognizes the mechanics of narrative as a means of, shall we say, social order and movement. And as someone who knows how the sausage is made, she's also therefore uh, the most cynical observers of its use. Now, I, I agree. So, but what you, you know, what you're bringing up about like why are people turning against her? You know, she's really on the money on these things. Her being on the money in this day and age is not the locus of her worth anymore. The locus it's of her worth anymore not, is her identity. Unfortunately, she's not. She, she doesn't identify as. She, there's no way to paint her as not somewhat waspy in some way. She was a wasp, actually, but I actually don't know. But in the sense of Anglo-Saxon Protestant, Didion doesn't sound like that kind of name, but she definitely came out of that rarefied milieu. The problem that you have, though, is like, it, okay, let's say she had written about, you know, the plight of the underclasses in an explicit way and tried to identify them. Mm-hmm. No one would have believed it. 
And she would have been accused, now in contemporary policies, she would have been accused of cultural appropriation, and then she would have been accused of overt sentimentality. So, and she wouldn't be declined toward in the first place. It's just like, um, I'll give you an example of this where I feel very similar. I used to write a lot of poems about race. Um, because, it, not because like I'm a social justice warrior, whatever that means, I didn't like that term, but it seems just derogatory, but, uh, but because it was part of my growing up, there was this really ambivalent relationship I had with the African American community, I was well aware of the history there, but these are also the people I knew as a child, I lived in their neighborhood for half my, for about half of my, you know, childhood life, then I moved to the suburbs, and then I moved to Canada, but but as a young child, I lived in black neighborhoods, and when I was with my, um, with other family members, it was dominantly black neighborhoods, and so it came up. Um, and there were two responses. One is that I was too obsessed with race, and then I was too upset, you know, and I should just be obsessed with the purity of art. And two, that in my poetry there was no real answer to any of it. There wasn't a progressive vision, even though. You know, there's obviously struggling through it. But I didn't feel like you could just, you know, you know, I was, I, I didn't feel like you, you could just let it go. And I feel, I feel the kinship in Didion in this, and like, it's almost like the conquering of the West is a background original sin for the United States. It's underneath things. And in that sense, it seems like leftists would kind of dig it. But what they don't dig. Is, it, I think you're right, part of its identity, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt and a little bit more good faith. There's also no resolution to any of it. And in her view, there's no way this is going to end well for anybody. Well, again, I, you know, to be reflective of the criticisms I have seen, I don't get the sense that that level of appreciation or even understanding that that's what Didion is doing factors well, into it. A lot of, I think so. a lot of the response I, fee, I see is more criticism of her attitude. Maybe that does get into the whole notion of like not, uh, you know, bringing forth a solution, you know, that's that progressively minded social, you know, social obligation of literature bullshit, which I absolutely despise. I'm going to put my cards on the table for that one. But, you know, I get, think people are pissed at, why, you know, why do you feel you're distant from this? Or why, you know, she comes across like this, basically this cold bitch. I mean, I think that's a quote of what people would say about her. You know, that uh, attitude to me suggests that, you know, again, we have come through in literature this idea of, uh, the literature almost as a performance art of the self, which Joan Didion, I mean, herself is in here. And in fact, some criticisms of her at the time, I think there's a, a pretty interesting Martin Amos essay on the White Album, really saying like she's putting herself for, uh, front and center in that, especially in the titular essay. But, you know, compare that kind of presence to the presence you're going to get in, let's say, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to use a sort of, you know, uh, perhaps not the best example, like Lena Dunham's essays, self-essays, completely different. It's not anywhere near. Well, look at Lena Dunham thing. also doesn't have anything else to write about. Um, that's the, that's I, the thing. We're, you're not expected to write about anything else other than but, the, the I was complaining you. about this in the early aughts when I was getting into an MFA. And I, I'll honestly say this, that I think this is, Partly this this cultural shift in politics, but I'm also going to say it's still, it is very explicitly tied to MFA and New York culture. Both that don't really you don't have to have done anything to write about stuff. <laughs> so what the hell else are you going to write about? I mean, particularly because a lot of these books. Um, a lot of the literary stuff, you're kind of trained to be apolitical, even though the, you know, the underlying politics of that culture is far left, well, center left liberal that thinks it's far left, but, um, also, I mean, it's also important to note that Joan Didion is, you know, part of, I think it feeds into the tone. She is a working writer by that. I mean, look at where these articles are published Saturday evening post, uh, in particular in those early essays, Vogue. Um, these big um, sort of 
widely consumed magazines. It's surprising to think that there that such essays would have found their place in there. But what's important there is that it, that's why I stress she was a working essayist. She was. But those markets don't exist anymore. They don't exist anymore, and the result that you now get is that when you do write and it is published, it's. Um, I'm not saying you're getting published in a vanity press, but it's a vanity in the sense that uh, you are, you know, you don't ex- your audience for your work can be a lot more specific, and it becomes weirdly enabling of self-referentiality. Well, one of these things that I, I like to talk about, I'm a poet. People know that I publish poetry on our site. I used to go when I was in an MFA. I'm, I'm referring back to my MFA because it's really relevant to this Didion stuff, actually. I really struggled with whether or not I wanted to publish in the kind of things that would help me build my academic career, even in literary journals. I'm not even talking about academic work that I do. Or publish online, because at the time it was still kind of taboo to publish online. That, you know, that really changed really late. The taboo against that really only dropped in like 2007. So talk about like slow response in academia. But because I knew that these, these zines and stuff had a print run Maybe 200, 300, no, and then I'd have, I'd listen to poets even tell me, like, oh, I subscribe to this, but now I don't read it. And I'd be like, well, then what the hell do you expect us to continue to do this? And that's because it became a closet art. Now, Didion is writing for a broad audience at literary standards, which, like you said, it's hard to imagine writers doing that now, there isn't kind of an attempt to bring it back, uh, ironically, online. Both Longform and Aeon are trying to bring these long essays back. And a lot of them are good, but they're not these kinds of essays. And, and I think there's a few things to that. One, and, and I'm, I feel like I'm on shaky ground on this, but I feel like it has to be brought up as a possibility. The skill sets to do that seem to be a you know, step or two removed from people. Uh, and two, just like the very idea of doing something like that and what it meant and how it, you know, what it, f- you know, what it requires of you is also alien and removed. The experience of thinking this way is gone. Right. Well, you think about the training. I mean, to bring it back, you know, this is where our confluence of me as a historicist and you as artist, which I've always felt is weird because... I'm the person who actually works as an artist. But anyway, um, <laughs> really comes to play because you're right. It is gone. And part of the reason why is you can't make your living doing it. Even something like Aeon, I mean, they probably pay fairly well. They probably pay market rates. All of those people writing those are people who work in other fields trying to popularize other research. They're writing science articles or cultural criticism articles, but it's not their primary job to be a writer. So they're not approaching this as a form of antidote. They're approaching it as a form of popularizing other complicated research. And a lot of the stuff, like I said, is good. A lot of it's well written. But it's not the same thing. The only people who kind of still get to do this are war reporters. And even they're dying out. The idea of a working writer is almost impossible to fathom, and particularly if you're in literary writing. And ironically, despite what people think, literary writing is where there's the most money. Can I give a sort of example to help help illuminate this? Maybe because you know, just to give people a sense of what we're t- sort of talking about. In anime, there's a parallel situation going on in animation. So if you notice why all animation on television looks the way it does, even stuff that is two dimensional, it's because it's all done digitally. The uh, the skill sets of cell animation, literally drawing your work on a cell, thousands upon thousands of cells at a time, and photographing them in sequence and editing it together on film. The reason that isn't being done is not just because no one wants to do it, it's because those skills, frankly, don't exist anymore. And I think we're in the same situation in the, in literature, even though uh, superficially you'd say, you know, is it... You know, the, theoretically, it's easier to obtain said skill sets, but it's the same situation. Uh, my argument here is there's more people writing at a beginner level than ever before, and some of them are quite good. But, and I mean, I'm serious about that. There's a lot of good bloggers, a lot of good genre fiction writers, a lot of literary fiction writers. Um, none of them are making 
a living doing that, though. Now, to be fair, that's not completely modern. If you go back to Philip K. Dick in the, in the 50s and the 40s, that was actually standard then, too. That literary culture where people could exist as working writers as their primary job, and you had a lot of people doing it, existed basically in the 1890s, and 1910, and then like in the 50s and 60s, and that's it. Except for people who were patronized by rich people. All right, that's that's just a little bit of literary literary theology for you. There's there's a fundamental weirdness in that, but that's that is truly sad. I think it's completely. True, and I also think that you go back to the animation parallel, and maybe we can tie it back into Didion really fast. I was watching Daria, of all things, all right? Mm -hmm. MTV, not, late 90s animation. It was hard to watch. Not that it was bad. It actually holds up. Unlike, like, say, Beavis and Butthead, it's actually still funny. But I'm not used to watching cell animation anymore. It seems crude. Yes, I mean, and you're getting to the heart of it, and again, why, um, you know, being able to, I think one of the things we say, it's like part of the issue that certain kinds of old writing uh, or art doesn't exist is because the ability to consume it, the skill sets to consume it also gone. I think, you know, it's right on the money. Now, like, uh, I, I can still watch the cell animation just fine um, and also read, obviously, the stuff we're talking about because we're talking about it. Uh, but I do recognize sometimes it's as tactical as saying, you know, there's illusions that I don't get. Sometimes it's even, like, at a high level, like, I don't even know what you're getting. Why aren't you mentioning this, that, or the other? Or, you know, again, as I said, relating to some of the criticisms, about it. it's like you know would it would it not have been better if you were this other type of person which to me is an asinine question to even posit but we do it all the time right i mean joan didion exists joan didion existing in the 60s and 70s when she wrote it's not like if she didn't exist somebody from a different perspective would have filled in those boots and it's completely ludicrous to pretend that it would have been that way. And I mean, that's just bad social cultural history. It's not like, you know, um, Alice Walker would have been famous earlier because Joan Didion wasn't writing in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You might have got something even dumber that we wouldn't remember, um, which there is plenty of. You know, my my literary contrariness aside, I'm always digging up old authors that people don't remember and talking about how great they are. You know, my my current one is Elaine Dundee, I believe, who wrote the comic female comic writer from the fifties. Uh, but even I'll say that like it's not like that the canon would have been publishing a lot more of these people. There's there's tons of them that I've forgotten that were good then, some of which were fairly subversive. Another example I like to talk about is a book called No-No Boy, which even in minority literature is understudied. All right? And it's it's written from a Nisai point of view. In the 40s, of all things, it's an amazing book. It exists. No one read it. So I, I don't know if you have a particular, you know, piece of criticism you found about Joe Diddy and that you want to dissect, but, uh, you know, as I'm sort of just thinking through it, there's a few things that, you know, obviously come to my mind. Let's just sum it up in two questions. If Joan Didion were not as, in her writing, cold and clinical, would she have been forgiven? Number one, I have the answer to that already. And then the other one is, had she been a different person? Had she not been as we alluded to in the opening paragraph, an embodiment of the elite, which I still find kind of weird because she, you know... She she's a woman come... in the 50s and 60s. She's and a 70s. woman in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. You know, she's a, a working writer. Uh, you know, it's hard for me to just accept the fact that this is a, a woman who is of the elite. Certainly she's well-respected. She writes about, you know, even being, you know, you know, called like a woman of the year you know, and all that, but she didn't, she never thought that she had, if she had any responsibilities on that level, she certainly acknowledged that she never fulfilled anything of them. I didn't, she didn't consider it was appropriate for her to do so. Um, but needless to say, she is being punished for some reason. 
understand. That. Well, um, for one, I think she's easy to punish because once she's not writing anymore, she's not going to defend herself, and she's complete. And honestly, she's even though she's writing about it and trying to work her way through it, she's a broken woman who is going to die soon. I mean, I don't just mean that. I mean, she is literally. She's what seventy something, eighty something. She's eighty one. Yeah, she doesn't have a. The most we're going to get out of her is probably ten more years. And it's doubtful because she's broken. Losing your husband, one thing. Losing your daughter is another. Particularly the same year you lost your husband. Because so, so the added complication as well. Uh, maybe it's just too much uh, details. You know, when she, her daughter was ill when her husband died. In fact, her daughter was in a coma when her husband died, and in fact, right. she had to tell her daughter that her husband had been dead. A couple of times, actually, because she was coming in and out of consciousness. And so you're you're talking about a woman, as far as domestic tragedy is concerned, who's faced the brunt of it. There are things that are worse, but you know, of the tragedies that most of us are going to experience in life, that's the one that breaks people. I mean, like even if let's say Joan Didion was more like Susan Sontag, she just she had cancer. For me, I feel like Joan Didion would have just powered through that and would have accepted it, one way or the other. It's different when it's the people around you and you feel like you have no control over the situation. Right. Two, so my guess is that's part of it. Two, so she's not going to defend herself. I also think a lot of it has to do with the popularity of her last two books. It's not like people weren't talking about her from slouching towards... Um, Jerusalem all the way to political fictions but the last two books put her back on the bestseller list and you know people get oh white person's tragedy well okay I get it do you get have a sense that perhaps the reason her two recent books were popular is that in a roundabout way, even though superficially people are operating under the sense of sympathy they're really taking pleasure in this woman's pain I do. I do, but I, I don't think it's like politicized pressure. I don't think they're like. Well, I don't oh, think it's. Po- I don't think it's politicized in any conscious way by any means. But I do think there's a fundamental. It's the same, You know what I think it is. It's the same thing as you know when people love reading Anne Sexton, the power of Anne Sexton. Part of it comes. I mean, she's a great poet, but part of it comes that you're literally watching her life unravel in front of you. There's a voyeuristic pressure in it. And you kind of know. I mean, particularly if you get really into her poetry and her letters, she's going to commit suicide. Like you could figure it out. And the same thing would, to some degree, with Sylvia Plath. And I'm not saying like. So in a way, it is exactly what you're saying, but it's not political. It's just weird sympathy where you, you where you do feel for her, but you're also like, oh, thank God, it's not me. How much can this person endure? Let's see, find out. It's part of the reason I'm actually um, not actively going to read the books until perhaps after she's passed away. Large, I, I, and maybe you're thinking the same thing. I can't. Uh, I mean, I. I read I, a I year of natural thinking. I own the other book, but I just stare at it and just feel like I know what I know what's in that book. I can't, like, in a weird way, it feels inappropriate for me to. Yeah, she's still alive, and she's still dealing with this. And I don't see her producing a whole mo- a whole lot else either. So yeah, it, it, my prediction is even if she hadn't been dispassionate, I think people don't like the dispassionate style now. It's fallen out of vogue. But they would have turned her anywhere. I mean, they're gonna, I mean, like I'm gonna go ahead and say it. There's a lot of people who are in vogue right now who are gonna get turned on very soon. I feel like Beck Dell is one of them. Um, her comic books are gonna get called out for being too self obsessed. Well, I feel like you can theoretically just make a list and go down the list, particularly of your – I mean, we're talking about mid-century writers. Go through every single last one of them. The thing is that the critiques against these authors will follow very predictable paths. They will either be labeled as misogynist, uh, self-obsessed, uh, elitist, which in a round you could interpret a few ways, but, or you know, microcosmic. They, you know, they're not concerned with the whole – Colorful I mean, universe. And, so, of and to go even further, I think this is going to happen to most of the writers of color, too, actually. Frankly, I do. It's not going to stop with the. With, with, the Zet guys doesn't stop 
when it starts moving. I, I also think any author, and this may be tied into the new generation of um, college thinkers, I think anybody who has as part of their writing a true desire to be, make people uncomfortable, and I don't mean the sort of accepted uncomfortable things like, you know, you know, poking your nose at the establishment kind of cliched uncomfortable. In my mind, that isn't making anyone uncomfortable. But I'm talking about the re- deep to the bone uh, discomfort that Didion is creating and others like her. I have a feeling this generation will reject it completely. Are you optimistic about the future? The future of what? Us. I don't know. I don't know. I hope so. Time passes. Could it be that I never believed it? Did I believe that the blue nights would last forever? 